The individual recognized throughout history as King Edward III was born at Windsor Castle in the English county of Berkshire on November 13, 1312. His paternal figure was Edward II, the formidable Edward I, also referred to as Duke of Aquitaine in France, whom he succeeded in 1307. At the age of 23, Edward II had already fathered a son named Adam Fitzroy, which was illegitimate at the time of his accession. Consequently, the birth of Edward III in 1312 was met with great jubilation, as it ensured the continuation of the royal lineage. Queen Isabella, the progeny of King Philip IV of France and mother of Edward III, was born in 1295. Having spent her childhood in the royal palaces of France encircling Paris, she entered into matrimony with Edward II in January 1308. At the time, she was a mere 12 years old, and only a few months had passed since the commencement of Edward's turbulent reign. The England that would later become Edward III was founded in 1312 during a period of great instability. During his lengthy reign from 1272 to 1307, Edward I established one of the most powerful kingdoms in Europe. During this time, he reformed the judiciary and administration, completed the English conquest of Wales, intervened in Scotland, and extended English rule across the Irish Sea into Ireland. Nonetheless, the establishment of this extensively centralized and proliferating English realm during the reign of Edward Longsharks posed a significant dilemma after his death in 1307. His son, Edward II, was a feeble monarch who vested immense authority in a succession of privileged individuals during his 20-year reign. This practice incited intense animosity among the English nobility and political elite. One of the most favored individuals, Piers Gaveston, had developed a close association with Edward in approximately 1300, during their adolescence. The sexual nature of this relationship is still a subject of considerable debate. However, upon Edward's accession in 1307, Gaveston was bestowed with immense authority, he was ultimately elevated to the position of First Earl of Cornwall and bestowed with numerous offices. Nevertheless, his conduct profoundly infuriated the nobility, and the king was compelled to temporarily exile him. This occurrence transpired mere months prior to the birth of the future Edward III at Windsor Castle. However, the conditions of Edward II's reign failed to improve in the years that followed. During the 1310s, the king developed a similar predilection towards Hugh Dispenser, the son and namesake of the Earl of Winchester, that he had previously displayed towards Gaveston. The English nobility's resistance to Edward II's rule intensified in the years that followed the Dispenser family's ascent to power. Furthermore, Edward I's advancements in Scotland were reversed in 1314, when the English suffered a catastrophic defeat at the Battle of Bannockburn at the hands of a Scottish army led by Robert the Bruce. To make matters worse, England was afflicted by a famine in the mid-1310s, thus, the England in which Edward III spent his childhood years was no longer the England of today. Surprisingly little is known about his upbringing, however, Young Edward was likely unaware of the state of the country when he was a young man. Rather than being crowned Prince of Wales, as has been the case with almost all direct heirs to the throne of England since the late 13th century, he was given the honorific title of Earl of Chester during his youth. Edward was raised in a household that was distinct from that of the monarch and queen. During his youth, he welcomed a number of siblings, including his brother John, born in August 1316, and two sisters, Joan and Eleanor, who were born in 1318 and 1321, respectively. Edward potentially received a limited education from Richard Berry, a renowned scholar of 14th century England. Nevertheless, his upbringing and education were have been predominantly focused on the tangible realm of existence, rather than the intellectual realm of books. Although he acquired the skills to read and write French and English, his command of the Latin alphabet was rudimentary at best. Edward might have also dabbled in Flemish and German, but if the accounts of his later years are any indication, they were not substantial. As he approached his tenth year, the political climate in England deteriorated significantly. In 1321, a civil war erupted in England, 
largely due to the king's continued backing and lavish favors bestowed upon the Dispenser family and their allies. Thomas, Earl of Lancaster, a first cousin of the king and a participant in the downfall of Piers Gaveston in 1312, spearheaded this uprising. Despite the king's effective suppression of the rebellion in 1322 and the execution of Lancaster in March of that year in the vicinity of Pontefract Castle, the strained relations continued. Hugh Dispenser had achieved prominence in England at this time, but he was gaining an increasingly formidable foe in the Queen. Although Isabella had long harbored resentment for her husband's preferences, her conflict had not been with Gaveston, but rather with Dispenser. In contrast, during the 1320s, the Queen harbored a personal aversion towards her husband's preferred individual. As the months passed, this progressively incited her discordance with him, culminating in an impending confrontation. The political instability that had marked Edward II's entire reign was ultimately resolved by events in France. Since the Norman conquest of England in 1066, when William, Duke of Normandy, ruler of a large portion of northern France, had conquered England, the kings of England had held possessions in France. This continental empire expanded in the two centuries that followed to encompass additional regions in the southwest of the country, including the Duchy of Aquitaine, before contracting and losing Normandy and other territories. During the early 14th century, the English monarchs possessed solely the Duchy of Aquitaine in France, which belonged to the English Plantagenet monarchs and was not an integral part of the English realm. Moreover, due to the duchy's status as a constituent part of the French realm, Edward II, who died in 1314, ostensibly owed allegiance to the King of France, which at the time was Philip IV, the father of Isabella. However, a succession of brief reigns ensued thereafter. The early indications of Edward II's demise can be traced back to the familial bond between the English Queen and the newly crowned French King in the mid-1320s. In 1323, in Aquitaine, shortly after Charles's accession to France, a dispute emerged wherein a French King official was executed by the Seneschal of the Duchy, who served as Edward II's senior representative there. As a reaction, Charles IV launched an invasion of the Duchy, which prompted Hugh Dispenser to apprehend Isabella in England, where she was a French alien. Back in France, Charles IV received word that his sister was incarcerated in her adopted homeland and dispatched an emissary to Edward II in England, advising that Isabella be appointed as his ambassador to France for the purpose of engaging in peace negotiations. Although this was an unconventional proposal, the English king agreed to it. This event marked the onset of Edward II's downfall. Isabella, a French national, entered the orbit of Roger Mortimer, an exiled English nobleman who was surrounded by a faction of Englishmen who were opposed to Edward II and the Dispensers. Subsequently, a romantic relationship developed between the Queen and Mortimer. More significantly, the juvenile Edward, Earl of Chester, who would later become King Edward III, was banished to France in September 1325. The primary rationale for Edward sending his 12-year-old son to continental Europe remains a subject of conjecture. However, the most plausible explanation is that he declined to travel to France and stand before Charles IV as a participant in peace negotiations. Had he done so, Edward would have been obligated to pay homage to Charles, a fellow monarch who Edward was technically a subject of as Duke of Aquitaine. Edward seemingly devised a plan to transfer the Duchy of Aquitaine to his son, who was 12 years old at the time, in order to evade recognition of his subordinate status to the French monarch. Regardless of the circumstances, it was an abhorrent strategic error. The presence of the young Edward in France provided the anti-dispenser faction of English nobles at the Gallic court in Paris, led by Isabella and Roger Mortimer, with a viable candidate for the English throne to serve as a symbol for a rebellion. However, this proved to be a costly error in England, as the dispensers and the king issued a directive to return the young Edward to England. Isabella declined this order. Thus, by the end of 1325, Isabella and Mortimer had established a number of the prerequisites to attempt an overthrow of the dispensers in England and the administration of Edward II. However, Isabella's brother was unwilling to assist. 
Although Charles IV had initially offered assistance to Isabella during her ordeal in England, he refrained from endorsing an invasion of that country. Consequently, during the summer of 1326, Isabella, Mortimer, their adherents, and the young Prince Edward accompanied them on a journey to Hainaut, a minor principality situated in close proximity to the present-day border of France and Belgium. It was in this location that Isabella reached a bargain with the Count of the Territory, William I, whereby she would wed Prince Edward to Philippa, the daughter of William. In return for military assistance, Edward consented and furnished Mortimer and Isabella with several hundred men. Isabella, Mortimer, and an estimated 700 soldiers landed in Suffolk in late September 1326, proving that this small force was ultimately sufficient. In the weeks that followed, support for Edward II utterly vanished from England, sparking the abrupt release of years' worth of resentment towards his irresponsible rule and the undue favour he had bestowed upon the dispensers. The City of London issued a dire proclamation in support of Isabella and Prince Edward. The King was apprehended in mid-November and subsequently detained at Kenilworth Castle in South Wales. Meanwhile, the Dispenser family's senior members were apprehended and promptly executed. Subsequently, Edward II's reign came to an end with a reasonable amount of peaceful action. On January 13, 1327, Parliament voted to depose Edward II in favour of his son and namesake. The monarch was presented with the resolution at Kenilworth, and he reluctantly consented to abdicate on January 20, shedding tears. The Crown Prince Edward was formally crowned at Westminster Abbey the following week after being proclaimed Edward III, King of England, Lord of Ireland, and Duke of Aquitaine, in London on January 25th. All of these endeavours were executed in the name of Prince Edward, a 14-year-old at the time on November 14, 1326. Edward was without a shadow of a doubt a pawn at this juncture, and authority in England now resided with his mother Isabella, Roger Mortimer, her companion, and their adherents. In January, Parliament approved a plan for the young king to rule in conjunction with a council comprised of six barons of the realm, four bishops, and four earls. However, Isabella and Mortimer swiftly disregarded this arrangement, and for the next three and a half years, they effectively ruled England. During these early years of Edward III's reign, the realm was confronted with a number of issues, the most urgent of which was the condition of the former king, Edward's father. He was relocated to Berkeley Castle in Gloucestershire in the late spring of 1327. Nevertheless, a more enduring resolution was required as the regime of Isabella and Mortimer was rapidly generating unrest, especially among those dissatisfied with the authority Mortimer now possessed. This unrest was concentrating in certain quarters on the notion of liberating the former king and reinstating him to the throne. On September 21, 1327, a definitive resolution to the matter was achieved. The new regime in the north was arguably confronted with an even more formidable obstacle. Prompted by the opportunity presented by the instability generated by Edward II's overthrow, the Scots, under the leadership of Robert the Bruce, launched a sequence of raids into northern England and the Crown's holdings in Ireland. Thus, the youthful King Edward III launched his first military campaign into the north during the summer of 1327. This has since been dubbed the Weirdale Campaign, so named after the River Ware, where a significant portion of the conflict transpired during the months of July and August 1327. Throughout the duration of the conflict, James, Lord Douglas, along with the Earls of Mar and Murray, commanded a group of approximately 10,000 Scots southward into northern England. In the interim, Isabella and Mortimer, newly ascendant in England, perceived a successful campaign against Scotland's former foe as a viable strategy to legitimise their newfound authority in the name of young Edward. Thus, by mid-July 1327, they had deployed their own forces from York to the north in an effort to engage Douglas and the Scots. The two parties engaged in a two-week stalemate as they manoeuvred throughout northern England in an attempt to track the other's location and gain a tactical advantage. A three-day standoff ensued near the river where, then, at last, 
the Scottish forces launched an assault on the English camp during the late hours of August 3rd and early hours of August 4th, penetrating to the very centre of the English royal encampment. During this precise time, young Edward came perilously close to being apprehended by Douglas's forces. However, despite the tense ropes being severed, the young monarch escaped unharmed and uncaptured. This marked the pinnacle of the Weirdale Initiative. Despite several days of further stalemate, the Weirdale campaign ultimately failed to achieve a decisive outcome against the Scottish attack at its most perilous. In early 1328, the regime was compelled to stabilize the northern border by reaching a Treaty of Northampton. This agreement saw Edward renounce his English crown claim to the throne of Scotland and recognize Robert the Bruce as the rightful King of Scotland. Nonetheless, the campaign and the impending apprehension of Edward had ignited within him an ambition to attain mastery in the art of warfare. On the battlefield, he would never again find himself so defenseless in the face of an adversary. Furthermore, in February 1328, a diplomatic dispute ensued that would have unforeseen repercussions, adding to the difficulties already caused by the Weirdale campaign's relative failure. The French king, Charles IV, who was also Isabella's brother, passed away on the first day of that month. He had only daughters as issue, and since it had been decided that a woman would not succeed him, this marked the end of the direct line of Capetian kings of France, who had ruled the country since the late 10th century. The succession to Charles IV was between Edward III of England and Philip of Valois. Edward III, the grandson of Philip IV, the long-ruling king of France from 1285 to 1314 and the rightful heir of Isabella, possessed the strongest claim. However, Edward's assertion failed to garner significant attention in France, where the French nobility regarded the idea of a foreign monarch ruling France in conjunction with England as intolerable. As a result, the claim of Philip of Valois, a direct descendant of Philip III of France who ruled from 1270 to 1285, was favoured. On April 1, 1328, Philip was formally proclaimed King of France, and on May 29, 1329, he was crowned Philip VI at Reims Cathedral. When evaluating the subsequent events, it is critical to bear in mind that Edward possessed the superior lineage to the French throne by virtue of his mother. Furthermore, having already attained the throne himself, he considered Philip to be of lesser social standing, being a mere count. Edward was deeply motivated by his conviction in his divine right to rule and his superior claim to power, which solidified his resolve to prevail in the impending conflict. During the period between Philip's accession and his coronation at the end of May, a delegation led by Isabella and Mortimer arrived in Paris to express the disapproval of Edward's exclusion from the succession. Despite their entreaties, the French authorities refused to listen. Ultimately, after months of objections, Edward, who was 16 years old at the time, embarked on a journey to France in the spring of 1329. There, he paid homage to Philip VI as his subject in his capacity as Duke of Aquitaine at Amiens Cathedral. Although this appeared to be the conclusion of the matter, the dispute regarding the succession would become considerably more extensive than the apparent indication of agreement in 1329 had indicated. During this time of impending conflict between Scotland and France, Edward was cultivating and expanding his independence. As per the agreement Isabella had reached with Count William of Hainaut in November 1327, he was married by proxy to Philippa of Hainaut. This union was consummated in exchange for his assistance in the overthrow of Edward II in 1326. In 1327 and 1328, Edward was amenable to his mother's guidance on this and numerous other issues. However, by 1329, he had developed into a man of his own accord and was less inclined to permit his mother and Mortimer to administer the realm. In that year, confidential communications were transmitted by allies of the young king to the papacy in Avignon, which had established a rival papacy to that in Rome. These communications informed the papacy in Avignon that the king lacked the authority to govern independently. By 1330, Mortimer's adversaries had begun to circulate rumors that Edward II was still alive, and a conspiracy hatched by his half-brother, 
the Earl of Kent, to instigate a rebellion in the old king's name had been uncovered. The young monarch was, nevertheless, most motivated to act by rumors that Isabella was indeed carrying Mortimer's child. Aware of this, Edward's advisers, most notably William Montagu, a close confidant, became concerned that Isabella and Mortimer might devise a scheme to usurp the throne from Edward. Under this scenario, Mortimer, who was still wed to Joan, his wife of nearly 30 years, would divorce her, marry Isabella, and place their child on the throne. In mid-October 1330, following a conflict at Nottingham Castle, Edward made the decision to take action. A few weeks prior to his 18th birthday, on the evening of October 19, the young king, accompanied by Montagu and approximately a dozen other companions, stormed into the apartments of Isabella and Mortimer in Nottingham. A struggle ensued, resulting in the deaths of several of their attendants, before the king secured the arrest of his mother and her lover. In the days that followed, a parliamentary session was convened and the political nation was informed that Edward would henceforth rule personally. Mortimer was apprehended in London, where he faced allegations and acquittal without a trial for a multitude of serious offences and misdemeanours. He was executed on November 29, 1330, marking the inaugural execution at Tyburn, an area that had witnessed numerous political executions in England over the succeeding centuries. Although Edward spared his mother, it was the end of her political career. Following her execution, Mortimer was conveyed to Windsor Castle, where she allegedly experienced a partial nervous breakdown. She was confined to house arrest until 1332, at which point she was granted permission to retire to Castle Rising in Norfolk, where she spent a quarter century leading an extravagant yet largely inactive lifestyle. Occasionally, there were discussions regarding her journey to France, and her family maintained communication with her. However, Edward clearly hesitated to grant this request to a mother who had previously shown preference for Mortimer over her own son during the early years of his reign. Subsequent to her demise on August 22, 1358, she underwent a transformation into a nun of the Order of St. Clair, signifying her growing religiosity in later years. Following the departures of his mother and Mortimer in late 1330, Edward III was able to commence his own reign at the precise moment he turned 18. England had endured nearly constant unrest for the preceding quarter century as a result of Edward II's weak rule and subsequent usurpation of the throne by Mortimer. However, during Edward's tenure, England's power was restored and expanded. Under his guidance, the nation would reach an unprecedented pinnacle of development during the Middle Ages. In the wake of the Treaty of Northampton, which was reached in early 1328 between King Robert of Scotland and Mortimer and Isabella on Edward's behalf, this expansion of English power in Scotland commenced. Robert had consented to acknowledge the territorial assertions of a number of English border lords, most notably Henry Percy and Henry Beaumont, regarding lands in southern Scotland. Nevertheless, Robert made few efforts to effectively transfer ownership of the disputed lands to these lords of northern England. Neither did the minority government that ruled Scotland after Robert's death and the accession of his young son, David II, rectify the situation. The disinherited initiated a plot to depose the Bruce line in Scotland by re-endorsing the Balliol lineage as a monarch of Scotland. This lineage had been championed by Edward's grandfather, Edward Longsharks, more than three decades prior. As a result, the disinherited lords, led by Henry Beaumont, transported Edward Balliol, the rival claimant to the Scottish throne, from France. They concurrently petitioned Edward III for authorization to invade Scotland, but their request was denied. However, their actions may have received sufficient implicit support for the disinherited to decide to initiate their own military campaign independent of the king. A naval expedition led by these nobles departed Yorkshire in the summer of 1332 and arrived at Kinghorn, located in the eastern Scottish province of Fife. After advancing interior, they defeated the Scots in a decisive manner at the Battle of Duplin Moor on August 11, 1332. Although the exact number of casualties is uncertain, 
It is estimated that as many as 5,000 Scots were destroyed, while the disinherited and the Balliols suffered negligible losses. Edward Balliol was crowned King of Scotland six weeks later at Scone, initiating the Second Scottish War of Independence, an event that would endure for an extended period of 25 years. Although Edward had not explicitly backed the disinherited and Balliol during their conquest of Scotland, he was now confronted with the task of determining his position regarding the usurper. During a September 1332 session of the English Parliament at Westminster, a swift recommendation was made to King Edward to annul the Treaty of Northampton, which had been reached in 1328, and recognise Balliol's sovereignty over Scotland. To secure Edward's backing, Balliol made it clear that he was prepared to accept Scotland as a vassal state of the English crown and submit to his authority by paying homage to him. Putting these offers aside, Edward was apprehensive about committing to a potentially protracted conflict in Scotland. However, his position was forced to change in early 1333 when Balliol was compelled to retreat to northern England following a military setback at the Battle of Annan in December 1332. The English Parliament, government, including the Exchequer and Courts, were relocated to York, where they remained for the subsequent several years, in an effort by the young king to re-establish English control over Scotland, which his grandfather had successfully established many years prior but had dissolved during Edward II's ineffective reign. This exemplifies Edward III's determination and clarity of purpose in pursuing his objective. An initial endeavour was to capture the border town of Berwick, which was a constituent of Scotland during that period. In March 1333, Balliol, with the assistance of Edward, commenced a siege against this location. Early in the summer, when the monarch himself had arrived to campaign on the border, the garrison and townspeople had informed the David II government to the north that they would surrender without military assistance by mid-July. The townsfolk of Berwick's reaction to this ultimatum would result in the first of Edward III's numerous decisive military triumphs. Sir Archibald Douglas, the guardian of Scotland during David II's minority, amassed an army of over 20,000 men and advanced southwards in order to engage Edward's forces. They engaged at Halladon Hill, located approximately two kilometres northwest of Berwick, on July 19, 1333. Douglas led an army of roughly twice as many as Edward III did at the outset of the Battle of Halladon Hill, approximately 10,000 men versus the English army's 10,000. Nevertheless, Edward's strategic positioning partially compensated for his numerical disadvantage. He had seized Halladon Hill to dominate the surrounding region, and he had resisted all temptations to retreat, even when Douglas launched raids into northern England from the south during the battle. The English possessed exceptional military capabilities that would prove advantageous to Edward not only at Halladon but also on numerous occasions thereafter. Notably, they employed the six-foot-long longbow, capable of launching volleys of iron-tipped arrows that swiftly breached chainmail armor. This projectile was considerably more effective than the slow and cumbersome crossbows that dominated the majority of European armies during the early 14th century. The battle at Halladon Hill commenced around midday. Despite possessing a numerical advantage, the Scots were compelled to advance up the elevated terrain occupied by Edward's legions. Douglas should not have attempted to engage Edward while he was on the offensive, but due to the expiration of the ultimatum issued by Berwick to the Scottish government the following day, he was compelled to attempt to evacuate the town in order to prevent its surrender to the English besiegers. The outcome was a complete defeat. The English longbow was utilised effectively to decimate the Scottish armies as they endeavoured to ascend the hillside. Ultimately, the Scottish forces disintegrated and the English, under the leadership of Edward, advanced downwards in pursuit of the fleeing Scots towards the sea. By day's end, thousands of Scottish troops had perished, potentially comprising half of Douglas's 20,000-strong army, while Douglas and five Scottish earls perished. Halladon Hill was a momentous victory for Edward, one of the most substantial triumphs ever won by an English force against the Scots. It also marked the beginning of Edward's emergence as a highly formidable military commander throughout Europe. Furthermore, English arms were now in the ascendancy,
On the continent, English armies had been previously considered noticeably inferior to their counterparts in France and elsewhere. From a political standpoint, Edward's triumph in Scotland conferred vast advantages. Berwick promptly capitulated, and several Scottish magnates subsequently paid homage to the English king in the days and weeks that followed. More significantly, Balliol was reinstated to the Scottish throne, and in February 1334, he consented to the seed of eight counties comprising southern Scotland below the Firth of Forth and the Solway Firth. Subsequently, in June 1334, Balliol paid homage to the reinstated monarch. Following an 18-month whirlwind campaign during which Scotland was nearly wholly subjugated to the English, David II and his followers fled to France. Thus, by mid-1334, the northern frontier appeared to be secured in a manner not seen since the reign of Edward Longsharks. However, where Edward III achieved success, his former ally, Edward Balliol, was perpetually let down. Just after Edward reinstated Balliol in Scotland, he incited another uprising in the summer of 1334. Balliol was compelled to flee Scotland once more, prompting Edward to intervene on his behalf once more in late 1333. Therefore, Scotland maintained a degree of vulnerability by 1337, and the conflict would persist for an extended period of time. Nevertheless, the overall efficacy of Edward's policies towards Scotland in the 1330s is beyond dispute. He restored England's stability in the north beyond what had been observed for three decades and secured territorial concessions along the border. Most notably, he successfully captured Berwick, which would thereafter serve as an English stronghold on the Scottish border, with the exception of a brief period of time. Moreover, had it not been for other matters diverting Edward's attention in 1337, he could have potentially expanded his authority over Scotland even further. The distraction, which originated from France, would have had far-reaching repercussions for England and France for more than a century. The origins of the Hundred Years' War can be traced back to the demise of the Capetian dynasty in France and the premature death of Charles IV in 1328. As previously observed, Charles's demise resulted in the spring 1328 accession of Philip of the House of Valois as Philip VI of France. Although Edward truly deserved a stronger claim to the throne of France, the French nobility swiftly elected to support Philip's accession out of reluctance to have an English foreigner rule France. The war in Scotland, in numerous respects, presented Edward with the opportunity to re-establish his claims in France. Given that France and Scotland maintained a consistent alliance during the late Middle Ages, the old alliance emerged from their intermittent hostility towards England. Therefore, it comes as no surprise that subsequent to Edward's triumph at Halidon Hill in 1333, David II and his advisers sought refuge in France. Philip VI of France provided substantial support for David's cause over the subsequent years as Edward endeavoured to fully conquer Scotland. This support peaked in 1336, when an enormous French invasion of Scotland was considered a distinct possibility. However, Edward managed to avert this from occurring by destroying the coastal regions of Scotland, burning crops, and rounding up livestock. No French army could land there if it could not procure food to sustain itself in the weeks that followed. Midway through the 1330s, additional controversies deteriorated relations between France and England, most notably Edward's provision of refuge in England to Robert, Count of Artois, the cousin and mortal enemy of Philip VI. However, this ultimately proved to be the most direct path to the outbreak of conflict that precipitated the Hundred Years' War. Edward's most susceptible domain was France itself. On May 24, 1337, Philip VI officially declared his intention to seize the Duchy of Aquitaine from Edward. The Count of Eu was dispatched with an invasion force into the Gascony region late that summer. Although the force caused widespread devastation throughout the countryside, it failed to capture the duchy's principal city of Bordeaux from the English. This invasion marked the initial military engagement of a conflict that would endure for more than a century. Upon the commencement of the conflict in 1337, Edward and England were promptly confronted with a tactical dilemma. Aquitaine, situated in the southwestern part of France, 
posed a considerable challenge for English supply lines to penetrate. Consequently, Edward's initial strategic approach was to target the French by storming Philip VI's possessions in northern France, directly across the English Channel, and to exploit territorial gains in order to exert pressure on the French monarch. Nonetheless, there were issues with his methodologies as well. Edward would attempt to burn and pillage the French countryside, just as he had recently done in Scotland, in order to coerce the French into negotiations and obtain a strategic advantage. However, his strategy might have been more detrimental than anything else. Frequently, this form of scorched earth strategy yielded the exact opposite outcome, instigating animosity towards Edward and his legions among the populace of the regions they brutalized. This ultimately resulted in a strengthened allegiance of these regions to the French rather than achieving victory for them. However, this approach was not without its limitations, primarily concerning the logistical challenges associated with delivering an army to northern France. During the middle of the 14th century, the English merchant fleet had grown significantly. However, due to the limited capacity of ships at that time, transporting an army of Edward's magnitude, which was crucial for achieving military victories in northern France, would have been an extremely difficult task. Edward encountered this challenge in 1337, when war broke out with France. The proposed resolution mirrored a tactic employed by Edward's grandfather, Edward I, in the 1290s, he sought support from numerous princes and rulers of the Low Countries and Germany. As a result, the young king, who was only 24 years old at the time, dispatched to Europe in the summer of 1337 the Bishop of Lincoln, Henry Berghirsch, and his close ally, William Montagu, who had recently been ennobled as the Earl of Salisbury. In the subsequent weeks, alliances were expeditiously negotiated, encompassing Hainaut, Gelders, and Brabant in the Low Countries, and notably, Louis, Duke of Bavaria, the reigning Holy Roman Emperor. In total, Berghirsch and Montagu succeeded in securing assurances from these rulers regarding the provision of around 7,000 troops to support Edward in France, along with shipping and other logistical assistance required to transport the 10,000 men that Edward intended to personally transport to France. As a result, a force of nearly 20,000 men would be assembled and deployed in the field in northern France. However, these alliances were not without their drawbacks. By the end of 1337, Louis and the other princes had received substantial financial subventions from England to finance the mobilization of their armies. By that time, these subventions had totaled £124,000, which was numerous times Edward's annual income. As a result, Edward was compelled to borrow heavily from the merchant banking families of Italy during the early stages of the war in order to finance the alliance he had established. This subsequent development held considerable importance. While certain historical accounts may portray the king's use of parliamentary subsidies and financing, including that of Edward III and his grandfather Edward I, as an indulgent use of the legislature, such reliance was in fact vital to the establishment of the English parliamentary system. During the late medieval and early modern periods, it was universally acknowledged that parliaments were convened when the ruling monarch required financial support from the political nation, and that the political nation could lodge complaints and requests with the monarch in return. In reality, Edward's utilization of Parliament in this fashion contributed to the progressive formation of the Mother Parliament during the 14th century. Edward ultimately departed from England on July 16, 1338, with his armies and past Antwerp in the days that followed with nearly 5,000 men. On September 5, 1338, Edward and Louis of Bavaria met at Koblenz on the River Rhine in Germany, where the Holy Roman Emperor designated the English King as the Vicar General of the Empire. This was a momentous occasion as it theoretically placed Edward in command of the military resources of the entire Empire. Having secured this title and amassed the majority of his armies in the Low Countries, Edward was at last capable of capturing the field in northern France in the spring of 1339. Nevertheless, this inaugural year of active military campaigning was marred by Philip VI's refusal to engage Edward in direct combat. Their closest encounter occurred in October at La Capelle in northeastern France, 
which proved to be a largely unsuccessful endeavor. Perhaps as a result of his frustrations during his first year of military campaigning, Edward re-established his claim to the throne of France, a momentous decision. His official justification for his presence in France was the protection of his holdings in Aquitaine until early 1340. However, this stance shifted in January 1340, possibly influenced by a new ally of Edward's, Jacob van Artveld, a native of Ghent who had emerged as the preeminent political figure in the Belgian towns of Flanders. In 1339, Van Artveld garnered the support of Flanders and convinced the English monarch to reinstate his assertions regarding his rightful place on the French monarchy. This right was formally ratified by Edward on January 26, 1340, when he commenced utilizing the title and arms associated with the kings of France. During an illustrious and long-lasting reign, Edward's claim to the French throne was arguably his most renowned and enduring deed. Although English monarchs claimed the throne until 1802, this action gave England immediate cause to engage on the continent in strategies that enabled the English state to maintain a foothold in France until the mid-16th century. After assuming the French throne in 1340, attention turned to the naval campaign in the English Channel. During the early stages of the conflict, Philip VI amassed an impressive fleet of slightly more than 200 ships by the summer of 1340, supplemented by contingents from his ally, the Kingdom of Castile in Spain. By the time a decisive engagement was fought in 1340, the English fleet had grown substantially. On June 24, 1340, the pivotal naval engagement of this phase of the Hundred Years' War took place at Sluys, situated off the coast of Flanders. The English longbow, which had been so effectively employed in Edward's armies since Halladon Hill in 1333, was put to devastating use here by the numerically smaller English fleet, which was able to engage the French ships from relatively close quarters. By the evening, an estimated 18,000 French mariners and soldiers had perished, and all but 23 of the more than 200 French ships had been destroyed or captured. Furthermore, all of the French senior naval communications had been destroyed or captured. Edward showcased in this instance that he was not solely a military commander on land, but was also capable of securing decisive victories at sea. In fact, he had personally endured intense combat and sustained a thigh arrow wound. Edward won a decisive victory at Sluys, which ensured English dominion over the English Channel for an extended period of time and protected the south of England from prospective naval assaults until the middle of the 14th century. Nevertheless, Edward encountered a formidable obstacle that proved impregnable through land or sea, the escalating expenses of the conflict. As a result, in November 1340, just a few months following his triumph at Sluys, he clandestinely returned to England to confront the government, entrusted with the responsibility for managing finances during his absence. It is worth noting that the Archbishop of Canterbury, John Stratford, initially expressed strong disapproval. However, the two individuals managed to reconcile somewhat in 1341, when Edward's focus reverted to Scotland. During the late 1330s and early 1340s, France was embroiled in a war that inevitably took precedence over events in Scotland. However, this did not mean that the conflict in Scotland had ever reached its conclusion. In fact, when David II, who was approaching his late teenage years and establishing his own independence as a claimant to the Scottish throne, returned to the country from France in the summer of 1341, Edinburgh and Stirling were swiftly seized by the Bruce C.A. However, although Edward may have desired to persistently shift his focus to Scotland, the conflict in France quickly reclaimed his utmost importance. In April 1341, John III, the Duke of Brittany and ruler of the substantial fiefdom of Brittany in the extreme northwest of the country, died without a clear heir. The ensuing succession dispute provided Edward with an opportunity to demonstrate the legitimacy of his claim to the title of the Crown of France in France. In pursuit of this objective, Edward endorsed the claim put forth by John de Montfort, who was related to the Duke deceased via his niece, whereas King Philip VI of France backed the claim put forth by Charles, Count of Blois, who aspired to succeed to the duchy. 
the War of the Breton Succession, a significant component of the larger Hundred Years' War, commenced at that moment. It persisted for the subsequent quarter century as an independent conflict. From an immediate standpoint, the conflict in Brittany provided Edward with a favorable circumstance to further contest Philip's dominion in France, a prospect he skillfully capitalized on in the subsequent years. The War of the Breton Succession persisted at a rapid tempo until the mid-1340s. It was this regional conflict that served as the justification for Edward to initiate preparations in 1345 for a significant new invasion force in England. It would remain in France until the subsequent year, but once it did, the 1346 campaign would be renowned for producing some of the most consequential engagements of the Hundred Years' War and for Edward's most renowned military triumphs. The precise objectives and rationale behind the expedition to France in 1346 were predominantly concealed during its early planning stages in England. Even now, it remains uncertain whether a predetermined strategy guided the expedition from the start, or whether it was determined and refined in response to developments in France. We are aware of the precise events that transpired on July 12, 1346. Edward's army, comprising an estimated 12,000 to 15,000 men, arrived at the Catentum Peninsula in Normandy. His objective was to execute a military raid across French territory, a strategic maneuver that Edward favored greatly in France and which served as an additional pivotal plank of the military revolution that Edward instituted among the English. The subsequent weeks witnessed a tremendously successful campaign. On July 26, Edward achieved his first major strategic victory when he captured the Normandy town of Conn. The sack of the city lasted for five days, after which Edward's forces turned west, utilizing the newly opened route to Paris. Despite the considerable magnitude of the besieged city of Conn, the pinnacle of Edward's 1346 military campaign transpired a month later. During the English king's approach to Paris, Philip VI assiduously amassed his forces to defend the capital of France. By mid-August, the French monarch had amassed an army of considerably more than 20,000 men, which by the end of the summer had significantly surpassed the number of Edward's forces, which stood at around 12,000. In the interim, Edward had circumnavigated Paris and made his way northward to Flanders, intending to unite with former allies from the Low Countries. Consequently, the clash between the two monarchs on August 26, 1346 transpired in the vicinity of Calais, specifically outside the town of crecy en pontieu which was a considerable distance to the north of Paris. The Battle of Crecy, which commenced on August 26, 1346, would ultimately become one of the most pivotal engagements of the Hundred Years' War. Upon receiving information that Philip's army was in close proximity, Edward dispatched his forces to occupy the elevated terrain along the right bank of the River May, as it meandered past the village of Crecy. Edward had previously benefited from the high ground at Halladon Hill, and it was anticipated that the same would transpire here. The English forces were organized into three divisions, with two divisions of longbowmen flanking one unit of dismounted close combat fighters commanded by Edward himself. Late in the afternoon, the French launched a disastrous assault. The crossbow, the preferred French projectile weapon, was completely outclassed by the English longbow. A division of French crossbowmen was quickly annihilated by sustained English longbow fire. Philip then attempted to send his cavalry directly up the hill towards the English centre. However, similar to the Scottish at Halladon Hill, the French cavalry was completely overpowered by sustained longbow fire. As soon as the cavalry charge approached Edward's arrayed close quarters infantry division, they had already sustained significant losses in strength. The confrontation that ensued was a highly violent affair, in which the French suffered numerous casualties. By dawn on 27 August, when the French withdrew and abandoned the field in defeat, Edward's troops had been reduced to a mere few hundred, while the French had suffered approximately 4,000 casualties. In 1346, skepticism regarding the English longbow's superiority over continental methods of warfare and the crossbow as a projectile was dispelled by the Battle of Crecy. Furthermore, 
This event cemented Edward's status as one of Europe's preeminent military commanders by virtue of his decisive triumph over the French king on August 26. Despite being numerically outnumbered by an almost two-to-one margin at the commencement of the engagement, Cressy was not defeated. As a direct consequence of Edward's remarkable triumph at Cressy, northern France became substantially undefended. Consequently, on September 3, Edward redirected his forces towards the adjacent town of Calais, where he established a siege. Eventually capitulating on August 3, 1347, after nearly an entire year of efforts, the northern French port was ultimately vanquished. This must undoubtedly rank among Edward's most notable achievements. Calais remained under English control for more than two centuries before the French reclaimed it in 1558. Aside from the triumph at Crecy and the commencement of the eventual triumphant siege of Calais, Edward's England experienced additional significant triumphs during the late summer and autumn of 1346. During the King's sojourn in France, the conflict on England's northern border with Scotland persisted. In the early autumn, David II endeavoured to exploit Edward's absence on the continent by launching an invasion of northern England. This decision proved to be disastrous, and Philip VI, who urged his Scottish ally to honour their alliance by attacking England, provided encouragement for this plan. On October 17, 1346, at Neville's Cross near Durham, David II's forces, consisting of roughly 12,000 men, engaged in combat with an English force that was marginally larger than half of the number David had deployed to the field. The English forces, under the leadership of Lord Ralph Neville, decisively defeated the numerically superior Scots. Approximately 2,000 Scots were slain, but the most ominous development was the capture of David II by Neville's forces. Therefore, by the autumn of 1347, Edward had amassed an immense fortune. During the late summer of 1346, he triumphed over Philip at Crecy in France. The following year, he successfully captured the town of Calais. The de Bruce heir apparent to the throne had been apprehended in Scotland, which placed Edward in a negotiating position of immense strength in both France and Scotland. Edward negotiated a nine-month-long truce in October 1347 and then triumphantly set sail for England in an effort to solidify his position. During the winter of 1347 and 1348, at this pinnacle of success in England, Edward made the decision to implement a plan he had been contemplating since at least 1344. Edward, mesmerized by the concept of King Arthur and his round table, had long harbored ambitions to establish his own knightly order and round table. In 1344, he initiated construction on Windsor Castle, which would serve as the headquarters for such an organization. Having achieved military success in both France and Scotland, he decided to implement a variant of this plan, a knightly order dedicated to St. George, surnamed after the sword belt worn by its members. This resulted in the establishment of the Order of the Garter, a chivalric order that continues to be the highest-ranking knightly order in the British honours system. The emblem of the order is a garter bearing the motto, Honi Soir Qui Mal which translates to, shame on him who thinks evil of it, from Middle French. It is said that King Edward pronounced the phrase at court when the garter of the Countess of Salisbury became entangled in her leg during a dance. As a consequence of the monarch uttering those words in reprimand to courtiers who were amused by the incident, they came to symbolize chivalrous honor. Nevertheless, this anecdote appears to be fabricated, as no written record of it exists until the 1460s, more than a century after the order's inception. Edward and 25 knights comprised the Order of the Garter at the time of its establishment. It is not surprising that a number of the most senior nobles of the realm and supporters of Edward's cause were among the founding knights. For example, Henry, Earl of Lancaster, Edward, his eldest son and namesake, the Black Prince, and several others, including Thomas de Beecham, 11th Earl of Warwick, Jean de Grailly, Ralph Stafford, 1st Earl of Stafford, William Montagu, 2nd Earl of Salisbury, John de Lisle, second however, one or two members of the first Knights of the Garter were unexpected. Roger Mortimer, the 2nd Earl of March, was among them, which seems like an odd choice. 
This individual was the grandson of Roger Mortimer, who attempted to seize Edward's regal authority in the late 1320s but was executed at Tyburn in 1330. Early in the 1340s, Mortimer was partially rehabilitated due to his friendship with the Black Prince. Sir Hugh Courtney, Sir Richard Fitzsimon, Sir Miles Stapleton, Sir Thomas Whale, Sir Hugh Rusley, Sir Nelly Loring, Sir John Shandos, Sir James Audley, Sir Arthur Holland, Sir Henry Eam, Sir Sanchet Dabricourt, and Sir Walter Paveley completed the list of the Order of the Garter's inaugural members. A considerable number of these individuals had accompanied Edward on his 1346 campaign to France, and it appears reasonably certain that the order was established in 1348, at least in part, to commemorate the decisive triumphs that Edward had achieved at Crecy and Calais. Concurrent with the formation of the Order of the Garter, Edward initiated an extensive undertaking to rebuild Windsor Castle. Edward, cognizant of the propaganda value of a grand royal residence, oversaw the most substantial expansion of the principal royal residence of the High Middle Ages. In total, he spent £50,000 on the new complex, which was the most costly construction endeavour undertaken by any English monarch in the Middle Ages. However, it was merely one among numerous magnificent residences that Edward could legitimately claim. As an illustration, he had acquired Woodstock Palace in Oxfordshire, an expansive royal mansion constructed by King Henry I and serving as the venue for the birth of the Black Prince in 1330. Downfall would see the construction of Blenheim Palace in Woodstock. Nevertheless, during the height of Edward's reign, Europe was beset by a catastrophe he had no control over, the bubonic plague, also known as the Black Death in its 14th century form, which was transmitted to the continent by fleas that resided on black rats in the Black Sea region and was transmitted to Europe in 1347. In 1347, these items were conveyed to Western Europe via the vessels of certain Genoese merchants who possessed trading concessions in the Crimean ports, situated on the northern coast of the Black Sea. Bubonic plague is a highly detrimental ailment that culminates in fatality. Within the initial week of infection, those infected develop symptoms resembling those of the flu, such as fever, headache, and vomiting. Subsequently, lymph node enlargement ensues, manifesting as bubbos in the 14th century. These swellings typically occur in areas such as the neck, armpits, groin, or site of flea infestation where the plague-carrying organisms have carried out the disease. Eventually, these bubbles would rupture, leading to the development of gangrene in the extremities, including the fingers, toes, and tip of the nose. In the event of mortality, however, it would be attributed to organ failure, as the disease extensively affected the body internally. Although estimations of the mortality rate of the plague and the population of Europe at the time are notoriously imprecise, it is generally accepted that the Black Death claimed the lives of 30 million Europeans between 1347 and 1351, or roughly one-third of the continent's population. The onset of the plague in England was documented in October 1348, with the initial reported cases arising in London during the late summer. Edward possessed complete knowledge of the potentially lethal nature of the disease, given that his 14-year-old daughter Joan had died of it in Bordeaux, France, shortly after its initial appearance in England during the summer of 1348. As a result, Edward, similar to numerous English monarchs who followed in his footsteps, departed from London and spent the subsequent months in sparsely populated regions, where the perilous plague was less rapidly spreading. This constituted a form of medieval quarantine. The Black Death wreaked havoc on England, not only in terms of the magnitude of the loss of life and suffering it caused, but also due to the profound social and economic upheaval it triggered. Parliament, originally slated for 1349, was abandoned, and the courts were postponed for several months. In the interim, mass graves were excavated to inter the deceased, and the nation initiated quarantine and sanitation protocols, to the best of its ability for a medieval state. Recent events of the 21st century have demonstrated how crucial even seemingly simple measures such as quarantining and removing the still pathogenic remains of the deceased are in containing any pandemic.
Edward's government was effective in implementing these measures following the initial outbreak in 1348. However, following the initial devastating wave of the disease, the most critical concern was labor shortages. Due to the drastic reduction in population across the continent, the European economy would be plagued by a dearth of manpower for decades. Nevertheless, this predicament was mitigated in England through one of Edward's most understated yet consequential accomplishments. The monarch issued a preliminary ordinance regulating labor during the summer of 1349. The Statute of Laborers was enacted in 1351 as a subsequent measure. In doing so, wages were regulated to their pre-plague levels, thereby assuring the continued operation of the English economy during the severe labor shortage of the 1350s. While not met with the same level of acclaim as Edward III's military triumphs, the enactment of the Statute of Laborers was a pivotal moment in his reign. It effectively controlled the English labor market during the chaotic period that followed the Black Death and made England the only European nation in the 1350s to do so. Historiographers have also noted that the statute did generate social unrest and tensions among workers, who felt shortchanged in a labor market that had benefited them in the aftermath of the epidemic, which adds to the controversy surrounding its effectiveness. Furthermore, the responsibility for implementing the statute of laborers at the county level in England was predominantly placed on the justices of the peace, who were judicial officers tasked with upholding the law. The aforementioned offices were already in existence prior to the crisis precipitated by the Black Death. However, it was during the 1350s that they acquired increased jurisdiction and importance as local officers of the Crown. Consequently, Edward not only oversaw the establishment of a stable labor market in the wake of the Black Death via the Statute of Laborers, but the process by which this was accomplished also marked the beginning of the modernization of the position of Justice of the Peace. The Justices of the Peace maintained a significant role in English local government for centuries, and from the 16th to the 19th centuries, the office was exported to numerous countries. In an effort to better respond to the crisis caused by the Black Death, Edward implemented additional domestic reforms in the 1350s. Among these, a significant reform of the English coinage, which he initiated in 1351, gold coins and a new silver coin known as the Groat entered circulation. Edward, unlike other administrators of the early 1350s, did not possess a keen interest in the nitty-gritty of government reforms. However, he excelled in this regard through his discernment in selecting individuals who were highly qualified to supervise his domestic policies and delegate authority to them. Prominent figures in this context were administrators like William Shareshull and John Thorsby, who supervised the execution of policies including the reintroduction of coins in the mid-20th century. Particularly crucial for sustaining the perpetual war effort was the financial reform of England. Although the conflicts with France and Scotland persisted, the pandemic emergency precipitated by the Black Death ensured that the truce Edward negotiated with Philip VI in late 1347 was maintained for the most part until the late 1340s. Edward rekindled his aggressive pursuit of his claims in France against Jean II, the son of Philip, following the death of his longtime rival the French king on August 22, 1350. Nevertheless, his endeavors were impeded by a renewed French alliance with the Kingdom of Castile in Spain and the presence of a Castilian fleet in the English Channel during the early 1350s. Consequently, Edward was unable to execute any additional invasions of France during this period. Meanwhile, the succession war persisted. Due to this subsequent postponement and the repercussions of the Black Death throughout Western Europe, France did not witness another significant military engagement until the mid-1350s. Edward devised a dual-pronged assault when the time came in 1355. One would traverse the English Channel directly to northern France from Normandy, while the other would be executed in Gascony, situated to the southwest. The latter campaign, facilitated by Gascony, would for the first time prominently feature one of Edward's sons. Between 1330 and the mid-1350s, Edward and Queen Philippa welcomed a minimum of 12 children, who were delivered at consistent intervals. Of these 12, nine survived infancy, 
which was an exceptionally high proportion for the late Middle Ages. Five of these nine were sons and four were daughters. Edward, his son and namesake, succeeded his father. Born in 1330 and given the title, Black Prince, he assumed a substantial role in the French War starting in the late 1350s. At the age of 16, he was appointed commander of a detachment at Crecy, and two years later, he became a founding member of the Order of the Garter. In fact, the Black Prince assumed command of the Aquitaine Campaign in 1355. John of Gaunt, the third oldest surviving son of Edward III, was named after the town of Ghent three months prior to the Battle of Slaes when he was born in 1340. During the final 15 years of his life, John was also destined to have a substantial impact on English domestic politics and the Hundred Years' War. The dual expeditions of 1355 did not reach France until the latter part of the year. The king personally led his expedition across the Channel to Calais in the extremely late autumn. However, by that time, word had reached France that the Scots had once more exploited English engagements on the continent to invade northern England. Edward returned swiftly across the English Channel, and in January 1356, he initiated his final military campaign in Scotland. Due to this, about turn, in northern France, the Black Prince's campaign to Aquitaine emerged as the more significant of the two English expeditions to France during the mid-1350s. In mid-September 1355, the heir to the throne embarked on a journey to Bordeaux via southwest France, accompanied by approximately 300 ships and several thousand men. At this juncture, the military campaign season had nearly concluded. However, Edward Jr. ventured briefly inland in the direction of Toulouse before returning to Bordeaux for the remainder of the winter. Although the campaigns of 1355 were unremarkable, the one in 1356 stood out as one of the most pivotal of the entire Hundred Years' War. With an approximately 6,000 man force, the Black Prince embarked on a great chevauchée, an extended military raid through France, in July. As he advanced east through central France, numerous towns and villages, including Bourges, were consumed by his forces before they turned around and returned to Bordeaux in late August. Throughout this period of turmoil, King Jean II of France was proclaimed to confront the English army. Jean may have held the opinion that the Black Prince was not a capable commander in comparison to his father, and the French forces possessed a substantial numerical advantage over the English with a strength of over 10,000. However, if Jean too had believed that these elements would grant him a decisive advantage, he was gravely mistaken. The Battle of Poitiers, which ensued on September 19, 1356, resulted in another decisive victory for the forces of the Black Prince over the French. An initial feigned retreat caused havoc along the French lines, and the English longbow was once again utilized to devastating effect. By the battle's conclusion, an estimated 2,500 French troops were dead, but the most significant loss was the capture of Jean II himself. Given that David II of Scotland had remained in English custody since the Battle of Neville's Cross a decade prior, Edward III now held the kings of France and Scotland as captives. This circumstance conferred a significant advantage on the English king, who ultimately decided to demand ransom in exchange for political, military, and territorial concessions. With the Scots, on October 3, 1357, the Treaty of Berwick was executed, which resulted in the release of David II from captivity after a period of 11 years. Following the abdication of Edward Balliol's claim to the Scottish succession in 1356, Edward III had the opportunity to assert his own sovereignty over Scotland had he so desired. However, in contrast, he chose to adopt a more sanguine stance. In exchange for a ransom of 100,000 marks, approximately 67,000 pounds, David II was spared execution. However, this arrangement secured Edward's ultimate consent to the suzerainty of the de Bruce kings over Scotland, thereby culminating the protracted Second Scottish War of Independence, which had raged for 25 years. The negotiations for the agreement that was ultimately reached in France in exchange for the liberation of Jean II took longer. During this time, the French monarch was captured and detained in England at multiple locations, 
including the Tower of London. In 1358, a preliminary treaty was negotiated in London with the aim of releasing Jean and bringing an end to the war. By means of this arrangement, Edward's control over Calais would be formally recognized, and he would be granted the adjacent county of Ponthieu in the north, encompassing the present-day region of Picardy. Additionally, the Duchy of Aquitaine would be enlarged to encompass a significant portion of western France. In exchange for Jean's release, an exceptionally substantial ransom would be paid. However, despite efforts to reach a final agreement, this preliminary agreement remained unfinished. As a consequence, in 1359, Edward initiated preparations for a fresh military campaign against France, broadening his demands to encompass former English possessions in Normandy, Maine, and Anjou, in addition to suzerainty over the Duchy of Brittany. Edward, in exchange, made a solemn pledge to abstain from any territorial claims to the throne of France. However, the English king's proposed territorial concessions would have required England to directly possess nearly half of France, as well as virtually the entire north and west of the nation. Even though their monarch was in English custody, the French could not credibly contemplate yielding to this most recent negotiating position. Consequently, military operations resumed actively in the autumn of 1359, when an army led by Edward himself, consisting of more than 10,000 men, crossed the channel towards Calais. In the months that followed, a protracted and destructive march ensued through eastern and central France, during which Edward threatened Reims and Paris but failed to capture them. Despite this setback, Edward was unable to secure a strategic victory that would have enhanced his negotiating position during renewed peace negotiations. The French were hesitant to confront Edward and his English forces directly by the late 1350s, having endured numerous defeats at the hands of English armies that they had significantly outnumbered for the previous 15 years or so. Amid the impasse, discussions resumed in the early summer of 1360. The Peace or Treaty of Bretigny, which derived its name from the municipality in close proximity to Chartres where they took place, was ratified by Edward on October 24, 1360. As per the agreement's stipulations, Jean II was to be set free in exchange for a substantial ransom of £500,000. Edward, in turn, was to abstain from asserting his throne claims over France. In return, Edward would obtain the territorial concessions of Calais, the county of Ponthieu, and an expanded duchy of Aquitaine, which Jean had previously agreed to in London in 1358. A portion of the provisions outlined in the Treaty of Bretigny would ultimately remain unratified. Edward in particular was averse to relinquishing any claims he had on the Crown of France, and Jean too was similarly hesitant to remove any claims he held to suzerainty over the Duchy of Aquitaine. Nevertheless, the treaty was ratified and remained in effect for almost a decade. Although the treaty is commonly regarded as signifying the end of the initial phase of the Hundred Years' War, an attempt to assess it in this manner would require one to conclude that it arguably signified Edward's reign's pinnacle and a decisive victory for England in the aforementioned conflict. Due to the Treaty of Bretigny, the territorial holdings of England in France were more extensive than they would be at any other juncture throughout the Hundred Years' War. It is evident that the Peace of 1360 constituted a significant triumph for Edward and guaranteed that the English king could enjoy tranquilly throughout the 1360s, secure in the knowledge that his authority in France had achieved its pinnacle and that the Scottish border had been firmly established through the agreement reached with David II in 1357. In contrast to the preceding three decades, the 1360s were a relatively tranquil time during the reign of Edward. Due to the virtually continuous nature of the Peace of Bretigny throughout the 1360s, England experienced its first sustained period of peace during Edward III's lengthy reign. Considering the country's highly favourable position at the conclusion of the initial phase of the Hundred Years' War in 1360, this circumstance could not have been more unfavourable. During this time, there were several significant developments on the domestic front. For instance, in 1362, Edward, with the approval of Parliament, initiated reforms to the wool staple, which was the means by which wool was exported from England. 
The objective at hand was to establish a novel hub at Calais for the continental export of wool via a solitary continental port. This endeavor held substantial importance, given that the English wool trade, which was arguably the nation's most important export commodity for the next three centuries, was sold predominantly through markets in northern France and, more importantly, the prosperous commercial hub of Antwerp in the Low Countries. Edward anticipated the market demands of the 15th and 16th centuries by endeavoring to establish a staple at Calais for an extended period of time following the reform of the staple in the 1360s. English language reform, however, constituted the most significant domestic initiative of the 1360s. The Norman conquest of England from the early 1070s onwards introduced the French language and instituted it as the official language of the government and the tribunals of law. A new language emerged between the 11th and 12th centuries, which was a hybrid of Norman French and the Germanic vernacular that the Anglo-Saxons utilized prior to the Norman conquest. During the reign of Edward III, this English dialect referred to as Middle English had acquired widespread usage among the populace. However, French continued to be the official language of the courts and administration. Edward made an effort to reform this situation. In 1362, a statute of pleading was enacted, mandating the use of English in the law courts. Likewise, during the inaugural session of Parliament in 1363, the proceedings commenced in English instead of French. As a result, the 1360s witnessed several significant developments in the official adoption of English as the language of government and the courts in England. In another realm, the 1360s were a significant era in the administration of the Lordship of Ireland. Throughout the majority of his reign, Edward was preoccupied with France and Scotland, which prevented him from devoting much personal time to Ireland, which the English crown ruled in the eastern, northern, and southern portions of the island. Throughout the western half of the nation, several Irish lordships ruled and continued to contest English rule. As a consequence, Edward delegated the administration of Ireland to his second eldest surviving son, Lionel of Clarence, in the early 1360s. The subsequent years witnessed the fruition of this appointment. In 1366, a parliament was convened in the Irish Midlands town of Kilkenny, during which a succession of statutes were enacted with the purpose of establishing a division between the English and Irish in Ireland and safeguarding the English regions of Ireland against Irish encroachments. In the decades that followed, the statutes of Kilkenny, as they came to be known, protected the English of Ireland from Irish cultural interference. For instance, the statutes forbade Irish-English intermarriage and established safeguards to prevent the English from adopting Irish political and cultural practices. These measures effectively halted any possible waning of English influence in Ireland around the middle of the 14th century and, in some capacity, served as a significant cornerstone of the English Lordship of Ireland until the early 16th century. Although the 1360s were comparatively tranquil years during Edward's reign, the final decade of his reign, the 1370s, would present new obstacles. However, any evaluation of Edward III's reign and his legacy must recognize that the king did not hold the preeminent position in realm governance for the final seven or eight years of his reign. The initial mentions of Edward's deteriorating health appear in 1369, at the age of 57. Although he survived for an additional eight years, there are unmistakable signs that the monarch was enduring a growing number of mental and physical afflictions throughout the 1370s. Similar to numerous cases of illness among medieval monarchs, the precise nature of Edward's final years remains uncertain. However, it appears that a sequence of strokes he endured during his final eight years or so may have been the primary cause of his most severe ailments. Although Edward's influence on the governance of his realms was undeniably constrained by these afflictions, he continued to participate. Although the execution of routine governmental duties shifted towards his sons and extended family by the 1370s, certain momentous occurrences can still be attributed to Edward, even during his last years. The resumption of hostilities in France was of the utmost importance, Peace had been maintained in that region for over a decade since the settlement in 1360, 
However, the sustainability of this arrangement was progressively deteriorating over time. Charles V, who ascended to the throne of France in May 1364 following the ascension of his father Jean II, was a more assertive individual who, in the years that followed, endeavored to restore the French monarchy's former vigor following the damage it sustained in the 1340s and 1350s. As an illustration, he reconciled with Charles of Navarre, a minor kingdom situated on the southern border of France. However, more significantly, the French monarch reaffirmed the Duchy of Brittany's suzerainty under the authority of the French monarchy. However, a new confrontation with England was instigated in 1369 when King Charles took advantage of internal strife in the Duchy of Aquitaine to request the presence of the Black Prince. Upon the refusal of the heir apparent to the English throne to comply, Charles V angrily declared the Duchy of Aquitaine forfeit, thereby instantly reigniting the dormant Hundred Years' War. In retaliation, Edward recommenced his ascension to the throne of France, an ambition he had previously pledged to relinquish in 1360. As a result, the conflict was reignited during the final years of the 1360s, coinciding with the deterioration of Edward's health. This subsequent phase in the English-French conflict was notably dissimilar to the events that transpired in the 1340s and 1350s. To begin with, it is important to note that Edward abstained from personally leading an invasion of France. Instead, the implementation of military campaigns was predominantly entrusted to his sons, the Black Prince and John of Gaunt. Notably, in this regard, Edward had intended to spearhead an expedition to France in 1369, when the conflict initially arose. However, he was compelled to abandon his intentions, and John ultimately assumed command of the army as it traversed the Channel. Furthermore, during this emerging stage of the conflict, the rivalry between England and France grew progressively entangled with a sequence of internal strife and interstate disputes in Spain, which involved the kingdoms of Castile and Aragon, the two principal powers in that region. Possibly as a result of the extent to which England's triumphs in the 1340s and 1350s relied on Edward III's dynamic leadership and dazzling generalship, the country struggled during this most recent phase of the conflict without his direct participation. A significant portion of the Duchy of Aquitaine was conquered during the early 1370s, in part due to the Castilians' triumph over the English at sea off La Rochelle in southwestern France in June 1372. This setback restricted the extent to which English forces on the continent could be resupplied from England. In an endeavor to recoup the defeats incurred by English forces between 1369 and 1372, a significant military campaign was initiated in 1373. Under the leadership of John of Gaunt, this Grand Chevauché or raid advanced from the southern region of Calais, traversed eastern France, and ultimately arrived west of Bordeaux. Despite causing considerable devastation, the operation was a strategic failure that ultimately failed to achieve its primary objective of reinstating English dominance in Brittany. Consequently, by the mid-1370s, in the absence of Edward's leadership, the English presence in France had significantly waned and was predominantly restricted to northern Calais and the littoral regions of Gascony, which encompassed the city of Bordeaux. During this period of declining English fortunes, Pope Gregory XI proposed mediating a peace agreement between the belligerents in 1374. The treaty that resulted, referred to as the Treaty of Bruges, was ratified on June 27, 1375. Although it granted England a period of recuperation, it failed to garner domestic support, primarily due to the weakened English position in the northern region of France caused by the peace. However, this temporary arrangement did not endure for long, as the matter of Aquitaine's sovereignty remained unresolved despite the most recent treaty, and in the subsequent months, this matter sparked further unrest. The English desired the complete emancipation of Aquitaine from French rule, as this would guarantee that future kings of England would not be required to pay homage to the French monarchs. Although Charles V's reluctance to effectively relinquish any claim he held on the duchy was somewhat understandable, the conflict soon re-emerged in 1377 regarding this and several other issues. When it did, 
the government of Edward's successor would be tasked with overseeing it. Despite experiencing setbacks in France during the final years of Edward's reign, a number of domestic crises were adeptly managed on the domestic front. The most significant of these was the matter of financing a new period of war on the continent. Parliaments were convened in 1371 and 1373 to secure loans and subsidies from the lords and gentry of England. In both cases, Edward was required to make a number of concessions to the political nation in order to secure the necessary funds. Throughout the decade, however, resentment grew regarding the kingdom's finances, and it reached its zenith in 1376, when a parliament known to history as the Good Parliament, convened just one year prior to Edward's death, was tasked with providing additional funding for the monarch. During their April 1376 meeting, however, they utilized the occasion to express a collection of accumulated grievances, specifically targeting a number of Edward's advisers. In particular, the Parliament targeted John of Gaunt during the summer of 1376, when the Black Prince succumbed to gastroenteritis on June 8. An ultimately harmonious sequence of events transpired, culminating in the dismissal of the advisers who had provoked the political nation and the implementation of additional reforms. As a consequence, the English Parliament served as a mechanism for the English political community to seek redress towards the conclusion of Edward's reign, albeit in a manner that would deteriorate in the future. The fact that this was averted and, consequently, England remained free from any revolt throughout Edward's lengthy reign, demonstrates the domestic stability of his reign in spite of the recurring financial strains caused by protracted wars in France and Scotland. Nevertheless, the stability was deteriorating. In 1376, the assembled parliamentarians and nobles in London would have noticed that the king's health was rapidly deteriorating. At the age of 64, and after nearly 50 years on the English throne, he became gravely ill in late September due to a large abscess. A few days later, he attempted to finalize the provisions of his will in anticipation of his imminent demise. However, this did not transpire. Instead, the elderly monarch continued to endure. Nonetheless, the abscess ruptured in early February 1377, leaving him with significant physical immobility for the subsequent months of his life. On June 21, 1377, he passed away at Sheen Palace, the site where Richmond Palace would later be constructed, in close proximity to London. It was highly probable that his demise was the result of an additional stroke. At the age of 64, he had accomplished a great deal during his lengthy and influential reign as monarch of England. Jean Froissart, the preeminent chronicler of Edward's reign and the initial half of the Hundred Years' War, chronicled Edward's demise and funeral in his chronicles. Froissart personally experienced the event. On June 21, 1377, the valiant and noble King Edward III passed away, much to the profound anguish of the entire realm of England as he had served them well as king. His like had not been observed since the reign of King Arthur, who had previously ruled England, referred to as Great Britain at the time. As a result, King Edward was embalmed and ceremoniously carried through the city of London on a bier borne by twenty-four knights adorned in black. His three boys, the Duke of Brittany, and the Earl of March accompanied him on this procession, which proceeded at a leisurely pace while leaving his face exposed. It would have moved the heart of anyone to see and hear the sorrow of the people that day. Their sobs, screams, and lamentations would have been unforgettable. It was an apt farewell voyage for one of the greatest kings of England. Edward II was succeeded by his grandson, Richard, who was born into the Black Prince and was a mere ten years old when he ascended to power. Richard II ruled until his cousin Henry Bolingbroke usurped him in 1399. During this time, England experienced numerous instances of mass social unrest and military setbacks, with the most notable being the Peasants' Revolt of 1381. Similar to his great-grandfather Edward II, Richard's dependence on a select group of trusted individuals generated widespread discontent. Although Edward was without a doubt one of the most enduring and successful monarchs in the history of England,
a generation of historians began to disparage him in the 19th century and questioned whether his reign could be considered a success. Nevertheless, this perspective is flawed due to the fact that Victorian era writers attempted to impose their own value systems on Edward's evaluation, rather than evaluating the monarch according to his own characteristics as one of the late Middle Ages. The moral concerns of subsequent generations would have made little sense to a sovereign who was born and raised in battle. In fact, it is problematic to impose moral judgments on the actions of individuals who lived hundreds of years ago. In recent times, historians William Ormrod and Ian Mortimer have effectively restored the reputation of Edward III. Edward's final years did experience some setbacks, particularly in France, but he was gravely unwell and power had largely devolved to his sons at the time. Disregarding this latter period, Edward's reign was unquestionably successful. During his reign, England experienced its zenith in the Middle Ages. From the 1330s to the 1360s, Edward not only ruled England, Wales, and a significant portion of Ireland, but also effectively established his authority over Scotland and substantial portions of northern and western France. Certain territorial gains, such as the fortuitous capture of Calais in northern France, were either permanent gains, as was the case with Berwick on the Anglo-Scottish border, or long-lasting losses. Furthermore, his instigation of the Hundred Years' War played a pivotal role in the eventual development of modern nation-states England and France by capitalising on their administrative and financial capabilities and fostering an emerging sense of patriotism through collective effort. In fact, when Edward issued requests for funds and personnel from the regions under his dominion in order to finance his campaigns in France, he was essentially instructing his subjects to devise more efficient methods of taxation and resource exploitation. This is the fundamental foundation of the contemporary nation-state, which is strategically positioned to maximize the utilization of its available resources in the name of governance. A significant portion of this territorial expansion was accomplished through Edward's exceptional military prowess and the military revolution he presided over. Throughout his reign, England became the military superpower of its time due to the English longbow. At battles such as Halidon Hill, Cressy, Neville's Cross, Poitiers, and others, English armies consistently prevailed over significantly numerically superior French and Scottish forces. In light of the foregoing, it is indisputable that Edward III ought to be regarded as one of the preeminent commanders in the annals of English and British military history. He stands in company with John Churchill, 1st Duke of Marlborough, whose handling of English forces during the War of the Spanish Succession in the early 18th century propelled England to the forefront of European powers, and possibly Arthur Wellesley, 1st Duke of Wellington, whose triumphant prosecution of Edward III's military leadership undoubtedly exceeds that of his ancestor, Edward I, although he may not have achieved the same level of success in translating military triumphs into political triumphs, it is indisputable that Edward III possessed superior tactical acumen in battle. However, Edward's legacy should not be solely evaluated in terms of his military prowess. By founding the Order of the Garter in the late 1340s, which remains the preeminent chivalric order in England, he contributed to the Kingdom of England's reputation as the most chivalrous in Western Europe during the height of the Middle Ages. He further asserted his authority over the globe by rehabilitating and enlarged Windsor Castle, a symbol of English royal might. An additional enduring accomplishment occurred during the late 1340s and early 1350s when Edward effectively led England through the turmoil caused by the introduction of the bubonic plague to Europe. The Black Death, which ravaged England for the better part of a decade, was the greatest peril Europe encountered in the late Middle Ages, perhaps one-third of England's population perished within that brief period. However, instead of psychologically succumbing to the onslaught of illness and death that afflicted England in the Edwards' reign and its achievements were, nonetheless, in numerous respects about long-term nation-building. During his tenure, Parliament gained prominence and he began to employ numerous emblems that would later come to represent England as a whole, including the Cross of St George, which he carried into battle. However, 
Edward's most significant contribution may have been the reformation of English courts and government to prioritize Middle English as the official language of England. As a consequence, when England and Britain began establishing colonies in other parts of the world in the succeeding centuries, English became the language of England and Britain that spread internationally. The significance of Edward III in relation to these pivotal events of the 14th century is indisputable. Thus, he was arguably the greatest monarch by England. In your opinion, what is King Edward III? Did he reign as the finest monarch in the history of England? If so, is his obscurity today unjust? Kindly provide your feedback in the remark section. Until then, we appreciate your attention.